Hey, Dan. Dan, you know we're live, right? Yeah. Um, just give me a second. It's asking for my password. Dan. Okay, I'm Dan, in. Dan, you just spelled your password for the entire attendees of the webinar. You know that, right? No, I was you muted. You were not muted. We heard you. Your password is Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a lucky guess. <laughs> nope, you spelled it out for us. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. It's it's an unbreakable password. Okay, Dan. I think I'm safe. <laughs> Whatever you say. Well, for those that are interested in learning other ways to secure your credentials besides just having it be like Dan and um, putting it Ch putting Chuck Norris as your password, we wanted to bring in Roger Lamarca to talk to us about how to secure credentials. So, Roger, welcome to Texon Live. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and why you're the expert? Thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm a senior architect on the U.S. public sector team uh, here at Citrix. So I spend uh, you know most of my time uh, implementing Citrix solutions for customers, especially on the authentication side. Um, we do a lot of work with identity providers and implementing a lot of the Citrix specific features on the back end. So excited today to um, you know share some of my experiences and best practices. Yeah, with some of the other. Um security sessions that we talked about, we always reference this Verizon data, be data breach investigation report. And and what you see is different categories of security breaches that have happened over the years and what's rising and what's falling. And actually stolen credentials, I think is like number two now. You know, so it's a really big issue for people. Yeah, I mean, definitely. So, I mean, just as you, uh, you know, mistakenly did, <laughs> users are always, you know, entering their credentials on multiple different websites throughout the course of the day. Um, you know, potentially these websites, even though we should be using different credentials everywhere, a lot of times users use the same one. So we're, we're definitely prone to, you know, our credentials being stolen for a breach or, um, you know, using some other different attack vector. So the goal overarching when, when we're deploying a Citrix solution with our identity is really just having that one strong primary identity. And then our secondary resources are based on the authentication of the first. So. From the consulting point of view, I get this question a lot. What really constitutes a strong primary identity? To me, it's something that's not uh, susceptible. Some of the common attack vectors that we see. It's something that verifies who you are and something that you have. So we're seeing a, from a wide variety of our customer segments that pretty much they all, we have to use Active Directory on the back end, but they're putting different services on the front door, such as Okta and Azure Active Directory to basically lock down that front door access to really start having a more secure primary identity. Um, if we don't have MFA, you know, when we're getting into an environment, um, we're, we're basically opening ourselves up to a huge attack vector. So traditionally, when we start securing that primary identity, you know, we leverage things such as time-based tokens, uh, SMS codes being pushed to the phone, or even just push notifications on the phone. Um, you know, they're definitely really good and they solve uh, security most of the time. There are definitely situations where, where it doesn't work. Um, for the most part, when I'm working with customers, we're implementing Citrix Workspace, for example, and they don't have a third-party MFA solution. Using the built-in time-based uh, token factor solution really works great for the most part. Um, however, these traditional MFA uh, solutions, they're, they're definitely prone to uh, certain type of attacks. We have phishing attacks, replay attacks, and, and potentially malware um, that they could be infecting your phone. So, you know, even when there isn't an MFA code, for example, we've seen certain situations where even using push notifications on the phone, that if a user's already stolen your credentials and you get a notification on your phone, either by mistake or, or just by habit, you'll accept it and the user could potentially, you know, get into a website. So needless to say, we really need to start getting more uh, um, serious about security serious and, about and come to the realization that, you know, this traditional MFA it really isn't enough going forward. Yeah, and I, I can tell you just from my personal experience, like the TOTP, those those codes on my phone, I have like 30 of them now. And it takes a while to find the right one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's just really not scalable to a certain point. So we have to worry about that from a user perception point of view. And then we have to worry about just, tr you know, targeted attacks. So, you know, if an attacker wants to get into something and something's already really leaked out, probably potentially going to get in. We definitely have a lot of uh, you know, new features at our disposal here going forward. We can really stop a lot of those common attack vectors from actually occurring in the first place. 
And this is where password authentication, passwordless authentication really shines, right? So we take a step back and understand the second factor. Um, according to the, the National Institute of Science and Technology, which really sets the standards for a lot of these things, you know, they basically categorize our second factor in a few different ways. So something you know, which is what we're, we're used to, time-based tokens, SMS, something you have, such as a security token, or something you are is biometrics. We need to really start getting down to the, the second and third one um, to really start, you know, driving the, you know, improved security overall. So, you know, we've had solutions such as smart cards and pins for a long time, especially in the government field. But for the most part, it was a very expensive solution. There really was no turnkey way to get those, um, those users onboarded into the environment. Um, and for the most part, we need a standard. We remove user and passwords from the equation. So if a website breach happens or just improve the overall user experience, there's less stuff for them to have to remember and less stuff they can get leaked out. So this is where the, the FIDO2 standard really comes into play. So successor of um, the original FIDO, and it basically has all the advantages of the original one, but the new standard allows it to be used as a passwordless authentication method. Um, it also has some really cool features basically to um, allow users to uh, establish their, uh, their token automatically through certain protocols. And uh, you know, a lot of these security keys even have biometrics. So it's something you have along with having a unique public and private key cryptography to actually you know, make it an individual key pair for that user to log in. So it's really cool, the different options we have, you know, even on Azure AD, for example, um, the Windows Hello feature, we can actually leverage that and that's 502 compliance. So we have a lot of different options going forward here to sort of eliminate some of those um, more traditional MFA methods that are, that are vulnerable um, under certain situations. So the next question I get often asked, so we have all these cool new features, right? H how do we integrate this with, with Citrix? It really comes into two different ways. We have authentication to our Citrix workspace. So basically see a list of our applications, desktops, websites we have available, and then actual authentication into our workload. So when we talk about authentication into Citrix workspace itself, um, for the most part, uh, we have all our different identity providers, such as Okta, uh, Azure Active Directory, Okta, and Duo. They all support the FIDO2 standard. So a lot of these we can integrate directly into Citrix workspace service on our own, or if it's a uh, specific vendor that we want to integrate in, you know, we can leverage Citrix Gateway along with Workspace and pretty much anything that's SAML or OAuth based, we, we can get working. Um, when it comes to actually devices itself, you know, it's pretty popular to use um, specific uh, FIDO2 security keys from YubiKey, also some other vendors out there that have some build, uh, built in biometrics and Windows Hello is also pretty popular. So we have a lot of different options here we can pretty much integrate them all into Citrix in, in some fashion. So one thing to always remember is that even though we're using all these different identity providers at the front door to get in, in the background, we still have to match that um, account to an Active Directory account because that's required for virtual ass and desktop solution. So that's when we have Citrix Federated Authentication Services. So basically to have that full single sign-on experience when we're going for a SAML or OAuth identity provider, we need Citrix FAS to basically have that full single sign-on. So for the most part, Windows doesn't um, only understands a few different authentication methods, username and password, smart card, and Windows Hello. So basically, federated authentication services allows a virtual smart card to get created on behalf of the user logging in through Okta or Azure AD basically allow the user to log into Windows with a virtual smart card. So it's a really elegant solution and solves a, a lot of the problems and just makes the whole user experience a, a lot better. But as you can imagine, you know, giving FAS this great amount of privilege in Active Directory, we really need to make sure it's, we refine the access that it has. So when it comes to a consulting point of view, when we're implementing this in uh, large organizations, we try to really lock it down as much as possible. So one methodology that we like to take is the, the zero trust approach. So it's definitely a, a big buzzword in the industry right now, but it's really practical if you think about it. It takes a lot of effort, um, initial effort to get in, but once it's set up, we document how everything works, it, it just works. So basically, if you're not familiar with it, zero trust is a concept uh, basically around your know, organizations that really have strict access to everything, even if it's internal. So that's what we're going to be talking about next. So 
it's a quick demo if you're not familiar with FAS, the way it works. Um, oops, video here. Yeah, so we got the video here. So we got on the left hand side without federated authentication services and on the right with FAS. So this is an example here of um, somebody logging in to Okta. And on the left hand side, you're basically going to see what happens if we don't have FAS set up. So like I said earlier, since Windows doesn't support SAML going all the way through, when we actually go to launch our desktop, instead of going all the way into the desktop and be able to start working, we're going to get a, a log on pause. So uh, it's, uh, I, I do have to say, it's, it's not one of the most uh, um, entertaining demos in the world. <laughs> but uh, I, I think a lot of users will, will appreciate, you know, not having to sign in again. And I, I'm kind of curious how many people picked up on some of the uh, published applications that were sitting there in workspace. I think I saw Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may, and I'm, it maybe... looked like Roger stole your identity because it, if I read correctly, that was your workspace, Dan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe I do need to change my password. <laughs> I found it in some text files somewhere, but I, I got in and made it work for the demo. Um, mm. But, but o overall, you know, when we're implementing FAS, we, we just take, and we take a zero trust approach to make sure things down. We basically break it into to these three areas here. So we're gonna start with administrative access. So we're locking down the FAS server. We really need to treat it as a domain controller. And what does that mean? Basically need to limit RDP access. So pretty much it shouldn't be accessible from all computers in the organization. We can also do this via your user policies too. Basically we're fine who can actually RDP in. Um, enabling audit logging is really important too, and making sure those logs are actually going on a third party server and not being stored on the machine itself. So for example, you know, if a user is supposed to get in and they do make a change, we should have a, a log of who is actually logged in and at what time. So if a change did occur, you'll have a good indication of potentially you know, who did it. So one of the important things to understand too is that the actual FAS console doesn't have a separate login. So this is, a, this is actually fine. We just need to really make sure and refine who's actually a local administrator on the FAS server itself. So basically what happens is that any user is a local administrator on the server will be able to actually have full access to the console, make changes and view what's going on. So this is something we commonly see in organization. We'll actually have a GPO and we'll basically be setting our local administrators for you know, a large amount of computers. We basically wanna take a step back here and basically re really refine and validate who's actually set to the local administrator on this computer. So we basically limit the amount of people who can potentially make changes. Um, and lastly, on the administration side, we wanna explicitly define some of the FAS access control lists. This is basically defining what user accounts it can generate certificates for, and what virtual delivery agent machines can actually interact with the FAS server to actually start that process. So these are all standard operating procedures that you know, we do during a consulting engagement, but sometimes potentially get, get overlooked on some uh, implementations. So on the network connectivity um, side, you know, taking a zero trust approach, the, the first step is really understanding what that communication flow is. So I have to say for the most part, most customers don't take our guidance here. Um, a lot of times the infrastructure components, the VDAs are all on the layer, same uh, you know, layer two submit. And that makes things a little bit more complicated for putting ACLs in because we potentially have to do it on a physical or virtual switch. However, um, you know, we could potentially set these via the Windows firewall. We always recommend to set these on some sort of other physical you know, network appliance, basically limit communication. Um, so are the other things that sort of gets overlooked sometimes is adjusting the Windows Certificate Authority to use a static PC port versus a large range. So by default, there's actually a large range of ports that it actually uses to communicate between the FAS server and the Windows Certificate Authority. And it's really easy to actually just lock that down to a single TCP port so we can actually add our firewalls in uh, correctly. This is probably the third one is the one that gets overlooked the most since um, hit a lot of customers is Defining a single um, certificate revocation list communication method and really understanding what that is and how that um, actually plays into your environment. So by default, it's basically using LDAP. Um, we could also leverage HTTP too. So just really understanding that communication flow, it's basically from our domain controller that's authenticating that user account to one of our certificate authorities and make sure we have that understood and, and locked down and, and, and open to even function from a firewall perspective. 
And, and lastly, if we're using Citrus Cloud, we require outbound access from the FAS server. And this sometimes can be a problem, but the most part, if you take a zero trust approach to this, it, it's really not a big deal. For the most part, we always recommend customers when we're doing this, we either basically lock it down from a firewall perspective, so the FAS server can only get to the Citrus Cloud administrative URLs, or actually go for a proxy server, which is doing the same thing. So the most part, it's not a big deal, but it's definitely better to lock that down as much as possible um, in the event that something happens to the FAS server that just can't get to any random address on the internet. Um, so when we actually get to the certificate authority itself, um, there's a lot of important things to do here. I want to update the um, certificate templates that come with FAS. So by default, we have all the computers on our domain have the enrolled permissions. This is something we, we don't want set. We basically want to update the certificate um, smart card login template and a registration authority template, basically updated to only the computer accounts of our FAS servers. Because our FAS servers are the only computers actually interact with these templates to generate our certificates. The user certificate lifetime is also something that's pretty commonly knocked down. By default, it's seven days. A lot of customers that I work with want to put it down to um, one hour or a couple hours, just so in the event that the certificate does get compromised, that the end user really can't use it for a long period of time. Pretty simple. There's some definitely impact that to the scalability point of view, because we're basically leveraging more CPU at that point to generate certs all the time. For the most part, more of a, you know, on the security side to limit that down. Um, the last one here is the in-session certificate um, authentication. So for the most part, this is when we actually leverage the certificate generated by FAS to authenticate to websites inside our Citrix session. For the most part, most customers don't use this. Um, and we basically leverage, uh, recommend to leverage the primary authentication. So whatever we use to, to get in, to actually get to some of those, those backend resources, just overall makes, makes a lot more sense. So talk about some of the key takeaways here. So, you know, as we saw, you know, passwordless authentication technology offers security benefits for Citrix deployments. So we saw, you know, Dan leaked his password pretty easy. Websites get compromised all the time. Having a solution where we don't have to worry about that anymore, and then we can still get a full single sign-on experience with Citrix is great. And that's available today. Um, to actually get that full single sign-on, we need to leverage Citrix Federated yeah. Authentication Services Basically, anytime a user is not providing our password, we're logging into that front door. And when we implement that, we definitely recommend leveraging a you know, zero trust methodology to increase our security posture and um, all deployments. Awesome. Well, this was great information, Roger. I think, you know, with security being top of mind for all enterprises, it's it's awesome that we have ways to secure their identity besides just two-factor authentication and besides making our passwords Chuck Norris. So <laughs> we really exactly. appreciate you coming on TechZone Live and thank you so much for your time. Yep. Thanks for inviting me.